This episode may contain content of a graphic nature. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. I'm Nikki. And I'm Mariah. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Body to Burial. Welcome back, and thank you again for joining us on another episode. And today I'm pretty excited about this one because I've been looking at her Instagram for a while and she has some great content. Her name is Emily and she is a grief coach. Okay, so what does that mean? Because like I've heard of a therapist and a psychologist, but I've never actually heard of a grief coach. Therapists and psychologists are like working on your inner issues and stuff like that and trying to help you process. She's more... I would maybe classify it as, from what I can tell on her social media and everything, is a community, a a coach, like a life coach that will help you make decisions and do things in life, in your your personal life. This one is more grief, as if, you know, in someone's past or whatever, and whatever your grief is, either a relationship ending or whatever it is, she and this community help, I, from what I can tell, because I don't know, because we haven't talked to her yet, is what I can tell is this a community that helps guide you through your grief is what I'm thinking. Okay, so I'm picturing, because you know, you see them portrayed in TV shows. I'm thinking dead to me because I just watched that not that long ago. So I'm thinking kind of like a group of people that collectively come together that ex- are experiencing potential loss. But Emily takes a more hands-on approach. And while you're in a community setting, Maybe she's also working with you one-on-one to help you process and move through your grief and rebuild your life. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. I okay. mean, we could be totally wrong, but that's well, what I'm thinking. You know. Yeah. Because that that's what I'm thinking. Because when after my, my people have passed, I was gone this little journey to try to find anything to connect to other than, I mean, obviously I did the therapy and whatever else. But I felt like I was trying to connect with maybe other people that had similar circumstances. So then that's how I found her on her Instagram. And yeah, so I'm excited to talk to her. Well, great. I'm I'm happy to to go on this journey and see what it's like. It sounds like a good resource to know about if you haven't experienced loss. And if you have experienced loss, maybe a potential outlet that you should look into. Yeah, I I was searching for just other people with that had similar s- situations. So I'm excited to talk to her. I'm really excited to hear what she has to say. Awesome. Well, let's get her. Okay. Hi, this is Emily. Hey, Emily, it's Mariah. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. Nikki is actually the one that found you. She came across your Instagram and was like, we have to talk to her. I love (laughs) her. I want to hear all about it. I was reading briefly about your Move Through Grief company, and your official title would be a grief coach. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how does a grief coach differ from a therapist or a psychologist? Because Nikki, a couple years ago now, lost her mom, and so what... What would make her go to you versus the other? Or how do you differ? Yeah. Oh, my God. I love this question because it's been something I've had to work through in order to fully step into this space because I've really had to work around or work through my limiting beliefs around not having a mental health background or a professional degree in order to help people. So the way that I explain it to my clients and in my own mind is that a therapist or a psychologist is really about digging into your past, whereas a coach is about holding you in the space between where you are and where you are going. So what that looks like for someone grieving is they've lost someone who they love. And I basically try to sit with them in the space of where they are after their loss. And that means helping them cope with the emotions, normalizing the experience for them, explaining to them why they are feeling that way and why they feel that they are grieving wrong or doing anything wrong is largely due to the fact that we live in a grief averse society. So <laughs> where anger and sadness and depression and guilt are all just quote unquote bad emotions. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of grief education work and then I really do try to meet them where they're at and as they are ready to hear 
a potential reframe or another way to kind of rewrite the narrative on their loss, I kind of make the invitation to help them do that so that we're kind of doing the work around grieving our loss and also moving forward and rebuilding our life, hopefully with more meaning and purpose as they move forward without their loved one. So really it's about the trajectory forward as opposed to digging deep into somebody's past. So that's it in a nutshell. I can go in deeper. No, I think I think that's a great way to explain it because yeah, so if I were to pick a psychologist, they're probably going to say, okay, well, what was your relationship like with your mom? Why would you be mm-hmm. feeling these feelings? Why are you feeling regret or uh, this, that, or the third? Whereas yeah. if I came to you, you would be more focused on these are maybe the symptoms and signs of someone who is grieving. These are the ways that it's going to come out. This is how we're going to work through it. This is how we start to build our life without that person in our life. Totally, totally. And yeah, I definitely make people aware of their old wounds. We talk about old wounds, but I I kind of draw a clear line where I'm like, I'm not the person who's going to go unpack that for you. (laughs) That's where a therapist really comes in or a psychologist. I go to my therapist to do that type of work. What we're doing here is really about moving forward. And then the other component And when I say moving forward, we're not like letting go. We're not disconnecting from our loved one. We're learning how to integrate the loss as we move forward. So helping them understand that moving forward doesn't mean that we're leaving anyone behind, right? But then the second component is creating a community because often what I find with my clients is they go to therapy and it's kind of this one-on-one expert, you know, and then client relationship and you still kind of can feel alone in that situation. Mm -hmm. So I create an actual group where it's several people going through it and just the healing that happens when someone else reflects back to you. Oh my God, I feel exactly that way. Or, Oh no, you're not going crazy. I had that happen to me last week. You know, it just creates such a powerful community, which everyone's living through it together. And you just, I, I think what happens with a loss is that we tend to feel like victims. It's like, I'm a 32 year old widow. No one else is a 32 year old widow. Like I'm the only person going through this. And then When you realize that you're in a group of 10 other people who are going through this too, and then on top of that, they know 10 other people who are in the same situation, it's like, wow, okay, I can do this because I know other people who are going through this too. That's that's interesting that you say that because when my mom passed, I felt like I needed to figure out what is happening, what's Mm -hmm. happening with my life. And then (laughs) I started scouring the internet for people that are in the same situation or just quotes from people that are in the same situation just weird stuff like that where I mean it's not weird to the people that when you're grieving you go through all these different emotions but I just was searching out all these different things to try to explain what I'm feeling and then when I started therapy it was a lot of regrets I should have done this I should have done that and so I had taken all of those like coulda shoulda wouldas and absorbed them and then Mm -hmm. then I had all these different emotions on top of the grief like oh my gosh did I do this and then that's when she started to go downhill and you know all these crazy (laughs) stuff it's really weird I don't know no (laughs) it's so normal I see it all the time I lean on a lot of the work of David Kessler, he's like the grief expert. But what he always says is we'd rather feel guilty than powerless. And Mm. so our mind creates these stories where we try to assign blame. What was the one thing that caused my mom's death? Ian's cancer, right? Um, My husband's cancer. And it's because we'd rather assign blame to something than to realize that we live in a world that is random and chaotic. (laughs) And doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When I came across your page, I was thinking, I wish I would have known about your type of work after my mom passed and on top of the therapy. So the two together, I think would be fantastic. I don't know if that makes sense. It totally does. And I, I love it. Even if my clients aren't in therapy, I'm like, go. Right. (laughs) If, If you can do both, because it's true, they're satisfying two different needs. And when you do the inner work in therapy, and then you also have a community to tap into and then tools to help you integrate the inner work, that's where like the transformation really happens and and the healing really happens. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was kind of searching. And then once I got done, not done with the therapy because it's obviously ongoing, but once I got to, I'd say the year mark, that's when I started searching out the community looking for other people in different Mm -hmm. 
you know, social media pages that have gone through the same thing. And then once you look at a couple of things, then those algorithms will. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's so scary. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm like, Oh man. Okay. But I found more comfort in looking at the community pages than maybe necessarily the therapy. The therapy works great, and I'm not saying it doesn't, but I think the community stuff makes you feel not alone, like you said, and I'm not crazy for feeling this way, or I'm not this or that, and it's it's interesting. (laughs) It's like that extra layer. Like, of course, you know that your therapist is going to validate you. Yeah. It's like, are you getting paid to do this? Or are you really, are you really sure that this is normal? Yeah. So then, so then yeah. when you can go and see someone post about the way that they're feeling and it, it validates you, it's like, oh, okay, they don't even know me and they're feeling that. So, whew. Exactly. Right, <laughs> exactly. And during this whole process, I learned about, and I wish I would have known this before, was um, that anticipatory grief. That was something mm-hmm. that I had no clue that I was even feeling until after the deaths. I had the same experience when Ian was ill. And anticipatory grief is the grief that you feel before somebody passes away. So you're actively grieving their death, whether it's a terminal illness. This also happens in the case of addiction, right? You kind of, it's this sense of you lose the person before they actually die. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. You know, Ian and I weren't able to do some of the things that we used to be able to do. We weren't as active. His diet changed, their intimacy and our relationship changed a lot before his actual death. And so these are also secondary losses that come with the primary loss, but they happen before the death. And anticipatory grief is really, really hard. Um, And it's marked with a lot of anxiety and denial, sadness, anger. And I think a lot of people experience these emotions and they don't even understand why, because it's like my person is right here, but they might feel bad for already grieving their person. But the the loss of the relationship as you have known it has already occurred. Yeah. And it's really weird because you have all these emotions with it. And at the time, I didn't know any of these things. And then I'm just beating myself up. Why are you getting sad? She's still here. She's right here. You know, but it was all those things that you said, all these moments that used to be are not anymore. Grief is so much more a part of the human experience than we even recognize it. I think during the pandemic, a lot of these conversations started to arise and we were all grieving the loss of normalcy in our lives as everything kind of shut down and then not knowing when everything was going to return to normal, if, if it ever would have returned to normal, right? And so even that experience there, there was a lot of anticipatory grief and regular grief because of just like the loss of, of the world as we knew it. And so people think of grief in terms of just someone dying, but it's all of these little micro losses that occur along the way that elicit that same emotional response. Yeah. So it's everywhere. I have a lot of people that reach out to me and say, can I grieve someone who's alive? And I'm like, absolutely. You know, in the case of a breakup, the relationship ended, you were attached to this person. And now there's a massive void in your life and you're grieving all of the times of the day. You know, when you had coffee with them, when you texted them, when you would make shared decisions together, all of these micro losses (laughs) are a part of it and they all need to be grieved. After I had a profound loss in my life, your perspective on everything changes and you see things differently. Mm -hmm. Well, we talk about that in my group. That's part of the post-traumatic growth, right? The definition of trauma is something to the degree that it's seismic enough to rock you to the core and it kind of reshapes your beliefs about the world around you. And so the fact that, yes, you're saying like my perspective has changed so much is absolutely related to your loss. And part of that post-traumatic growth, it forces you to reevaluate everything within your existence. (laughs) And those small things that we used to get so caught up in do seem really small in the wake of something that's so massive and earth shattering. It's wild. I don't know if this is normal for everybody, but this was just part of my journey. I wanted to know where, where are they? Are they okay? Do you find that to be a normal thing that people want to connect with their person that's passed? Because I've been like, should I go to a medium? Should I go to a psychic? Yeah. Should I do this? Should I do that? Yes, absolutely. Well, I think there's a couple of different things going on here. Um, and it's all totally normal. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not being paid to say that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it 
be spicy often. When you experience a death, it brings you face to face with your own mortality. So these questions around the afterlife and what happens when you die, they naturally arise. It makes you not only think about where your person went, but also where am I going to go yeah. when I face my my own death because the threat of it is so much more imminent. The whole sense of stake and predictability in the world has been rocked and it's like, the shoe could drop at any time. And so mm -hmm. naturally these questions just come up for us. So that's part of it. And I also think this idea of how do we maintain a connection to someone through love, through gratitude, in spirit, beyond the physical, it's part of how we carry them with us as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And what I like to share with my clients is you can do this in so many different ways. And I mean, for me, <laughs> I was always really skeptical. I was like, that's BS. I'm not going to talk to a medium. And then <laughs> right around the anniversary of my husband was right when the world shut down with the pandemic. And I had all these healing activities that I wanted to do for myself and I couldn't do any of them. So I had an aunt who was like, Emily, you need to talk to this medium. So I was like, all right, fine. So I talked to her. And oh my gosh, did it change my perspective on really? the whole idea of, yeah, just connecting and um, if Ian still exists in some other realm, like where does that energy go? I believe his spirit is still, still here, whether it's in ways that I can connect to him through a medium or in nature, in the wind and the stars and the sky and the birds that fly up in different signs that I see in musical lyrics. And what I just say is like invitation for you to explore it all, because these are the questions that we are never going to have the answers to. Yeah. And if it brings you meaning, if it brings <laughs> you a sense of comfort and peace, then why the heck not? Right. Yeah. That makes sense. That actually makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I do hair and I, this person came up to me and it was shortly after my mom died and I'm had my client's hair da 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 and then she she walked by and she's like, I, I feel like I just need to come up to you. And she's she's like, does the number 11 mean anything to you? I, I just feel like I need to tell you about the number that you need to look for the number 11. Well, my mom died on December 11th and that was my parents' wow. anniversary. And so, and of course I'm crying because I'm like, Ugh. and so she's like, I, I just feel like I need to tell you that. And now it's funny because every time I look at my phone, it'll be 11, 11 or, you know, like one, one, one. And, and then now, every time I see that, I'm like, hi, mom, <laughs> you know, and I, I just kind of say that because I don't know if it's real or not. I just do it because it makes me feel good throughout the day. Obviously, you think about them, but I'll just like, hi, how are you doing, mom? <laughs> I hope you're thinking of me or, you know. Yes, I love it. And that's the thing. We're never going to have the answers to these questions and we get to create whatever meaning we want. That's essentially consciousness, right? We are in control of the story and the narrative. And if it's meaningful to you, if it brings you peace and comfort that is how you maintain that connection that's your relationship with your mom and no one can tell you if that's right or wrong or they can but like ultimately it's safe right yeah so exactly I love that and I have all my little signs and symbols where I get to connect with Ian in that way too and they get to change as well I always try to remind my clients that you know what what brought you safety and comfort and that sense of connection early on in grief might evolve into something totally different a couple of years down the road, but we kind of get locked into this idea that it's going to be this way forever. Yeah. Right? And so grief, it doesn't go away, but it absolutely gets to change and evolve as you do. Yeah. Especially in the beginning. Cause that beginning, I mean, you just feel it's never going to end and it's never going to change. And you're just in this weird state. I'm almost two years in now and I'm looking back like, okay, I did it. I'm, I'm two years in. I did it. I'm functioning and I'm doing yeah, good. celebrating you for that. <laughs> yes. And so we talk about our parents still as if they're still here. It makes us feel better. And sometimes when it's his dad, something will happen that I know just had to have come from his dad. It just, it had to have. And I'm like, I think that's Jim. I think that's him yes. like, saying hello, maybe, or something. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. If you're into that stuff, I would definitely go talk to a medium. I think you would, you would enjoy it. I've always been on the fence with it. And I'm just now starting to feel maybe I can, maybe I could do it. <laughs> And I think too, you know, what always is helpful or supportive in any situation is just to get really clear on your why. 
Yeah. So you can understand the intention behind it. And then you can kind of play with, is this really going to support that? Or is this just something, you know, that, because there might be other ways, that, you know, some of the women on my retreat were also talking about wanting to go and see a medium. And then by the end of the retreat, they were like, you know what? I, I don't, because I want to, my late husband to tell me that I, I'm doing okay. And, and then by the end of the retreat, they're like, I know I'm doing okay. Yeah. And so I don't need that anymore. Right. So just understanding the intention behind it. And I just know my personality that if they tell me something that is meaningful or, or something that I really want to hear, I know how I am. And I'm going to be like, okay, I'll see you next week. And then I'm wanting another and another and another. So I think that's also my hesitation because I do know how I get. Yeah, yeah, totally. Where I'm not satisfied. Where I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. let's try this again. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't like that message. Go tell them I didn't like that and bring me another one. Yeah, exactly. Or then I'm like, everybody, okay, I did my mom last week. So then this week I'm going to do my grandma. And then next week I'm going to do gym. And, you know, I just know how I get. And I think... That's also my hesitation. (laughs) Well, I've also had ones where a different spirit, like my grandfather showed up more than my husband. And I was like, what's going on? Like, Ian, where are you? You don't want to talk to me? So (laughs) I don't don't know. (laughs) And then you have a sense of disappointment. I was definitely disappointed with that one. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I guess, Emily, for me, I think it would be neat to go back. And I know you've kind of touched on it throughout talking here with Nikki, but you lost your husband. And through that, how did you end up creating your company Move Through? And what does Move Through offer besides grief coaching? Right. So let me backtrack a little bit. When Ian first got diagnosed with cancer all the way to the time of his death and then in the grief that followed, exercise was my safe haven. It was how I dealt with all of the big emotions in grief. For me, I didn't have a lot of sadness. I had a lot of anger and a lot of anxiety because I was taking on the role of husband and wife, mother and father, you know, head of household, all of it, right? And I luckily had a support system. My parents were amazing, but I was able to say, hey guys, like I can't do this. I can't even be a capable mom, let alone human being if I don't have a space to feel these emotions and somehow release them in a very physical way. I'm just curious, were you a workout person before this happened or did that just kind of happen when this stuff started happening with Ian? Great question. I've always been a movement person. So that was already kind of developed for me. And I've seen some people go from being super athletic before a loss and then just like being over consumed with grief and too exhausted to even move. And I've seen it the opposite too, where people find a pathway into movement through grief. So it's different for everyone. But for me, Mm -hmm. this had been my constant before and it was my constant after as well. And then I started sharing my story on social media. This kind of happened organically. I come from a marketing background, so I was always doing social media for clients. And when he first got sick, I started to go fund me to help cover some of the medical bills. And as I would share the medical updates, I'd always get feedback from people just saying how helpful they were. Whenever I wrote them, I kind of tried to add something positive. Or I always looked for the lesson in Um, whatever hardship we were moving through, there was always a takeaway, even if it was, this just sucks and I need to sit in it right now. (laughs) Because there was validity in that too. (laughs) After he passed, I had friends and family ask if I would continue to share our journey. And I thought about it and it had been really supportive and healing for me to just process what had happened to us and then to kind of find that silver lining, so to speak, right? And so I decided to start a blog and it was called Speaking the Silver. And so between this movement component of me working out and moving through my grief and then writing about it and sharing about it and having people comment on my posts and say how much my story was helping them, I just decided I don't want to go back to work. I don't want to go back to an agency where I'm making a minimal amount of money working my butt off and really not being able to be there for my kids. Like I need something flexible. I found a a local goal coach is what she was. And she and I met over three phone calls together and came up with the idea of move through. And at the time I was also teaching spin classes. So we started really small. I never thought this would be a coaching business. Move through started out as a an intention-based workout where I would basically invite people here in Denver. I'd say, we're going to move through anger this week. 
turn on some angry music and we'd get on the spin mic and we would ride through anger. I, I consulted a social worker to kind of help me create the experience so that people felt safe and supported to, to, to just feel whatever they needed to feel. And I think that was what was really powerful about it is that sometimes there are no words, you just need to feel it. And be, with everyone being in that room together in that dark spin room, we didn't have to say anything, but we all knew we were all going through that same pain. And it was another way to have our grief witnessed. So long story short, the pandemic hit and I had to pivot and I kind of started playing with taking this whole concept online. And I found that as much as I liked to move through my grief, I also really liked to talk about grief and to listen to people talk about their grief and, and to coach. So I ended up getting my grief educator certification with David Kessler. I invested in a business coach. And honestly, it's really just taken off in, I'd say, like the last year. But I try to offer a lot of free content. And I, I think it's it's something that I run into resistance a lot because I, I have to charge a certain amount for my coaching programs, right? But yeah, on the flip side, I'm trying to create so much free content that can support people just by scrolling through a TikTok or by joining my free Facebook group because access, I think, is really important. So there's all of that information where people, if, if they just want to educate themselves, kind of feel seen and validated by the content I put out. And then there's opportunities for people to plug in and work with me in a group setting where we're meeting every week and I'm witnessing and holding space and reflecting back to them. Is this really true? Or is this a limiting belief? Like, think you're really going to feel this way forever and doing that, that really high touch point coaching where these transformations really happen. But it's just been really cool to see some of these transformations. A life altering loss is horrible and I'd wish it on no one. And at the same time, grief breaks you open. It breaks you into a million pieces and you can build back your life to a remnant of what it was. It will never go back to normal, right? Or you have the choice to rebuild it to something stronger. And I don't know, I just see it as this opportunity to, to stretch and to grow and to transform. And I know that that's not the path for everyone and that's okay. Grief looks different for all yeah. of us. But the work that I do in my spaces is really using this as an invitation to build something stronger. And it's been really cool to just witness that transformation. And to me, that just adds so much meaning. It adds a whole new meaning to my loss and it gives me a whole new sense of purpose in my life. So long-winded answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, be that's a beautiful journey. It is. Yeah. It's got to be therapeutic for you too, because that's how I feel with when Mariah asked me originally to do a podcast, I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but it's been really interesting because we've been talking to people in all different fields. I like to find and I gravitate towards death doulas and and grief coaches. And I have have found this experience to be a little therapeutic because yes. then it's been nice because we've had a couple of people that have messaged us and saying, you know, I listened to this and I'm, I'm going through this situation and it helped me and it makes me feel good. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Exactly. And I think there aren't that many spaces where we get to talk about this in a safe space where we don't feel judgment or expectations about how we should yeah. be doing it. And I think these conversations are just so needed. It's like if we have to go through something as awful as losing your mom at a young age or your husband at a young age, it's like, damn, for me, turning my pain into purpose, that's what softens the pain of losing my husband, right? It's like another coping mm -hmm. mechanism. And it's not going to work for everyone. But for me, this is how I've alchemized the pain. But you don't realize right? it till you're in it. <laughs> you know, it's so true. Like I would hear stories of hardship and other people getting cancer or dying. And it's always like, oh, well, that happened to somebody else. It couldn't possibly happen to me. Yeah. And we like live in this world of denial where bad things don't happen until they happen to you. And then it's like mm -hmm. you're thrust into this whole new world where these conversations actually do happen. And I think depending on when your, your person died, it is fairly recent, you know, with social media where we're able to to connect with other grievers from around the world. Exactly. Where, as before, like I talked to another podcaster and he lost his brother when he was 16 years old. And mm -hmm. he was saying, you know, at that time he didn't have any community. And he was basically told to kind of like silence his grief because they didn't know any better. And that was at a time when they were saying like, you need to disconnect, you need to let go. Cause that was 
the the thought of the time that was the belief and it hasn't been until fairly recent where they're actually saying like no in order to integrate a loss and to heal you have to keep that connection death kills a person not a relationship and part of how we move forward is is by carrying our loved one with us I think that's part of the problem too is people have an expectation of time limits like okay it's been six months you should be moving on or it's been a year you should move on after a year so yeah you're saying it but you don't know until it happens to you. I might have said that to someone like, oh, they need to get over it and blah, blah, or whatever right. the case is. <laughs> but when you're in it, it's you, you don't move on. You, no. you move forward, but you don't move on, you know? Right. It's so true. And I think grief has taught me a lot of compassion in that regard, right? Because it's mm-hmm. like, you just don't know until you are in it. You just don't. And I think that's really hard because a lot of this additional suffering that I see with my clients is when others fail to understand their grief. And I'm not talking about strangers on the internet. I'm talking about like their parents and their closest friends, family members, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're like, you know, Joe, it's time to move on. It's time to get out there and start dating again. And it's like, no. And so part of the work that I do is like, okay, if you guys are here, you're the ones doing the work. So how do you own your needs around grief. How can we set boundaries with community members? We all have to be grief educators to the grief adjacent who haven't experienced (laughs) the loss, right? Yeah. Um, Because there's just such a lack of understanding and it creates so much more suffering for people who are grieving. Yeah. Because I have friends that will say to me, how are you going to feel when your dad starts dating? I'm like, you won't because I'm going to freak out. No. And then, well, he's, he's got to move on. I'm like, no, he doesn't. (laughs) And if he does, you know, and if he does, that's his journey. It doesn't have to be mine at the moment. So yeah, it's easy for other people to say that these events need to happen because of a certain amount of time. But if they aren't the ones experiencing it, then they're so quick to saying, well, they should be doing this and they should be doing that. Yeah, you think that, but you don't have the emotions involved with it. And I think we also need to break down the notion that like you can only love one person, right? So I started dating six months after my husband died <laughs> and I completely <laughs> surprised myself. Like I was like, whoa, didn't see that coming. Yeah. But what I reminded myself and I remind my clients now is the intention behind the thing. What's the energy behind the dating? It's not that I'm over my husband by any means it's that yes there's partially I'm filling the void (laughs) I am lonely I miss going on dates with someone he has been he was sick a while right I just miss dressing up and going on a date embracing someone other than my kids who are constantly touching me and nagging me and so (laughs) there can be many different reasons for why we start to date it doesn't mean that we're over our person. And yeah. even if you actually get into a romantic relationship with someone, you choose to remarry, that love for my late husband, Ian, is never going to be replaced. It's still there. In my heart, it's still occupying space. It's not It's not competing with the new love. It's that love is boundless, right? It's like the love for our kids. We love our first one. And they're like, how could we possibly love a second one? But you somehow do because our heart has the capacity to stretch like that. And again, grief and this idea of loss, it challenges us to reframe the way that we think about so many different aspects in the world. Another thing we've been taught is that we need to be feeling one way or the other. Mm -hmm. We need to either be over our husbands and healed before we are ready to date. And it's like, no, we can be feeling a lot of different emotions at once. I can be feeling really excited about the cute guy that just matched me on a dating app and then immediately (laughs) guilty because I feel like I'm betraying my husband or angry that I have to be on the stupid app in the first place, right? So I'm always like, it's a both and. You get to feel all of these emotions and we don't need to make any of them wrong because they're all valid. I think that as you get further away from the loss, you have more capacity to be able to hold space for other people's grief and to recognize that like that's their journey and that's mine and I think in the beginning it's too raw sometimes and for me personally I had to put uh, certain relationships on hold because I couldn't hold space for for someone else's grief I needed to just focus on mine and with time I was able to say okay like I get it that's how you're gonna grieve this is how I'm gonna grieve and we came back together so it takes time and 
And in the beginning, that's really hard to do. Emily, I wanted to go back to something that you had mentioned about having a support system to work through your grief. And I was wondering if you could speak to how people can allow people to grieve. Because for me, for my relationship, I'm in the fortunate position where I haven't had a traumatic loss in my personal life to this extent. And I would classify myself as like a fixer. So when somebody's hurting, I just want to fix them. And for me, fixing them is usually let's come up with a plan. Let's move forward. Let's do this. How can people support their loved ones that are going through grief without forcing them to move quickly through through their grief? Because I feel at some point, right, your life carries on. I didn't lose this person. So my week next week is going to go back to what it was like the week before. So I would just assume the Nikki's week is going to move along. So how could someone show up for someone like Nikki and support them without pushing them? Oh, I love this question so much. And yeah, it is. It's our natural tendency to want to fix people, to make them happy, to get them to just forget about their pain and move on. But yeah, yeah. it doesn't work like that in grief. And someone who says like, oh, just cheer up or tries to give you a platitude to cheer you up. It can feel like it minimizes your loss. It's like, no, like I can't just snap out of it. So what I always say is try to hold space, try to sit with them in their pain, right? Allow the griever to kind of guide you into whatever they need. So saying things like, I'm here for you, no matter what, I can sit with you in your sadness. And also being aware that for you to sit in sadness is hard. It's really, really hard to sit there and watch someone just fall apart. And at the same time, it's probably one of the most helpful things that you can do because they don't want to be fixed. They don't want to feel happy. So I always say, just try to sit with them in their sadness kind of hold space, show up. Even I would get a lot of texts where it's like, oh, I can take the kids or I can do this or that. And what really helped me was when people just showed up with a bag of groceries or saying like, hey, I'm going to take the kids for like an hour. You just do whatever you need to do because even making a decision in a really grief is really hard. It's like, I don't even know what I need, right? So just showing up, I think is, is helpful too. And I think again, just like letting go of the need to cheer them up and putting it more in their court. If they want to go out and have fun, they will communicate that to you. For me, I always wanted people to just trust me more, to trust what I needed. And try to like make me feel better. Yeah, I get that. And I think one of the other things too that challenging when you're trying to support someone you love through their loss is like, do we acknowledge it? Do we say, you know, oh, it must be hard for you. Today is your first holiday without your husband or your mom. You don't want to upset yeah. that person, but you're thinking about, oh, this is hard for them, but maybe I'm going to upset them more by mentioning right. it. So it's right. You know, I think like, that that is so valid and it, it happens all the time. Right. And again, I think it's just because there's so many societal norms that are influencing that decision to not bring it up. Right. We don't want to upset anyone. We don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers, but it, it's all OK. And when we don't, we actually create more disconnect and isolation for somebody grieving because they already feel like their grief is a burden and that nobody wants to talk about their loss because no one wants to sit with them in their pain. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I always say make the invitation to acknowledge it. Acknowledge a loss. Say, I you know, I know this is the day that your husband died. This must be really hard for you. I'm here for you if you want to talk about it or I can sit with you in silence. I'll do whatever you want, <laughs> essentially, right? But I think at least saying something and then somehow giving them permission to say that you're safe, no matter how they respond, can be such a gift to a griever. But to just not acknowledge it at all, when you when you know that someone knows that your person died and they don't say anything, it's like, ugh, gut punch. That's the worst. I've like stopped friendships with people or relationships because I'm like, you can bye-bye now, <laughs> you know? It's like clearly this day matters, mm -hmm. you know, something that we should be looking for that says, hey, maybe you're not processing your grief well, or maybe you're really struggling. Are there signs for loved ones to look out for? Yeah, so I really try to shy away from anything around what's right or what's wrong, because, again, I think it's really different for everyone. I do ask questions like, how is keeping a shrine of your loved one after 20 years? since they've been gone and you're trying to have a new relationship, how is that serving you and your new relationship? <laughs> and just trying to allow them to come to their own conclusions because it really is so different 
for everyone. And I just feel to categorize it as like healthy, unhealthy. I don't want to make that judgment, right? So yeah, I think if it's if it's serving you, if it's providing you meaning, I mean, a lot of people would look at me and say, oh, she's still talking about her dead husband. It's almost been four years. <laughs> but for me, <laughs> it adds so much meaning to my life. And I'm still feeling so much joy and love and fulfillment. I'm in a relationship with somebody new, just different for everyone. Okay, this is um, my other last <laughs> final question that I had because I, I wanted to see where you kind of stand on this because we've all heard of the seven stages of grief, which mm-hmm. is, I think, if I can remember, I'm like shock, denial, ugh, anger. I think it's a, it's a bargaining, depression, and then acceptance or something. Do you still feel that's a pretty standard flow for people's grief? Um, stages of grief have been so incredibly misinterpreted because Elizabeth Kubler-Ross actually created them for someone who was dying. It was the five stages of dying. She created them to just normalize the grieving process. And I would say that, yeah, I think a lot of people go through anger. They go through a sense of denial and shock and sadness and even bouts of depression. So what I love about the stages is that it absolutely normalizes the experience. It validates the emotions that come up. Just because she wrote about anger doesn't mean that everyone's going to experience anger in their grief. But I, I'd say for, for most people, yeah, I do feel like they experience kind of a range of those emotions. But there are also maybe some other ones that come up too. I think Claire Bidwell-Smith just did a book on anxiety and how there's a lot of anxiety in grief as well. And you know what? There's also joy in grief. We forget that it's also okay to smile <laughs> and <Yeah>. laugh <laughs> alongside our grief and then that gets to exist too. We're not doomed. We're not sentenced to a life of darkness after somebody dies. Yes, there's going to be sadness and anger and, and days where we probably wish our life was over. And there's going to be days where we are reminded that life is such a gift because we are here and our person is not. And that's sad and that's awful. But like, damn, wow, we have the gift of life and to celebrate that too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Emily, you're doing amazing work and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thank you. I was so excited for today. (laughs) Yay, you guys. Thank you so much. I feel bad because I have to jump right now, but this was such a great conversation. And I'm just like so grateful you guys had me on. So (laughs) thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. (laughs) Bye, you guys. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I would say your initial thought on what she does, pretty spot on. It is like that community aspect. It's working through collectively and individually yeah. your grief. So yeah, so bravo to you. You got the occupation right Thank without you. really hearing about it. So <laughs> good job. I really enjoyed her personality right? a lot. And her her mission behind Move Through is incredible. I think anybody that can take heartbreak, trauma, you know, any sort of challenge and turn that into something bigger than themselves and that gives, you know, meaning to their life in a new way is incredible. And so... I'm a fan. I know. So cool. I loved it. I thought she was great. I think her whole job and mission is great. I loved it. Yeah, it's certainly not something I've ever heard of before. So it's not something that I would have known to seek out. But I can see how it's very probably beneficial to have someone encouraging you and really focusing in on the grief and how we move forward versus the grief and how it makes you feel. Yeah, because I mean, there's a lot of people that they're not into therapy. They're not into going to a therapist. They're not into that. And I feel like this would be a good, you know, thing for them. It bridges the gap. A hundred percent. It's like support, but it's not the full in. Yeah, you're not the you're not in all the way. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, I loved it. I thought her I thought it was great. Loved it. Loved it. Well, she was wonderful. Thank you for bringing her to me and to all of us. I think it's a good resource, like I said, to have in your pocket. So thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll see what happens next week. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. And friendly reminder, if you enjoyed the episode or are enjoying the podcast overall, please share with a friend. Leave a comment. Leave a review. Let us know how we're doing. We'd love to hear from you. And any questions that you have for us or have for Emily, feel free to connect to us and we'll do our best to get them answered. We'll see you next week. Well, we won't see you. Well, you can hear us next week. We'll hear you next week. (laughs) Well, they'll hear us. But, you know, (laughs) we can all be together next week.
Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We do encourage you to follow us at Instagram at Body to Burial. Hit us up on Twitter at Body to Burial. And you guessed it, you can send us an email to hello at Body to Burial.com. If you have any guest suggestions, just let us know. Please hit the subscribe button or follow button on whatever app you are listening to. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.